Thank you, Sharon. Now it's time to present uh, to you our keynote uh, speaker for this evening, Professor uh, Sheila Jasanov. Uh, Sheila is the Vortheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is a pioneer in her field. She has authored more than 120 articles and chapters and is the author uh, or editor of more than 15 books, including, and I will only mention a few, uh, The Fifth Branch, Science at the Bar, Designs of Nature, and the Ethics of uh, Invention most recently. Her work explores the role of science and technology in law, politics, and policy of modern democracies with particular attention to the nature of public reason. She was uh, founding chair of the STS, the Science and Technology Studies Department at Cornell University, and has held distinguished visiting appointments uh, in the US, in Europe, and uh, in Japan. Professor Jasanov served on the board of directors of the American Association for the Advancements of Science and as the president of the Society for Social Studies of Science. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Salton Chair of the University of Ghent, and the Anne Kreutz from the Government of Austria. She holds a BA, JD, and PhD degrees from Harvard and an honorary doctorate from the University of Twente. And I should also add, as I mentioned earlier, um, a colleague, I can say a friend, I'm very pleased uh, to have Professor Sheila Jasanov here before. I invite her to talk. Let me also introduce uh, the commentator for her talk today, uh, Professor Ishai Blank, here from uh, the Faculty of Law. Uh, Professor Blank was the former vice dean uh, of the faculty. His areas of research and teaching include local government law, administrative law, global cities, urban legal policy, law and secularism, and legal theory. Professor Blanc obtained his LLB uh, and an additional BA in philosophy here at Tel Aviv University. He clerked for Chief Justice Aaron Barak at the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice. Uh, he continued his studies uh, at Harvard University at the law school uh, where he earned his LLM and uh, SJD degree. He was a member of the Young Scholars in the Humanities and Social Sciences Forum of the Israeli Academy of Science and Humanities and he is a two-time recipient of the Israeli Science uh, Foundation uh, grant. Professor Blanc is expected to be a visiting professor at Harvard Law School in fall 2017, and for those of you who know Harvard Law School, this is no small achievement. Uh, and he has been a visiting professor at Cornell, Brown, and the University of Toronto in Canada, uh, Science Po Law School in Paris, Hamburg University in Germany, Oniati International Institute and other places. Professor Blanc's work have uh, been published in numerous uh, journals and I won't mention them all, but Stanford Law Review most recently I think is one thing worth uh, mentioning. Um, thank you, thank you Ishai uh, for being here today as a commentator. Professor Jasanov will be talking to us about subjects of reason, goods, markets and competing imaginaries of global global governance and one of the reasons we chose this topic was because Hanoch, are you listening because this is uh, closely related also and ties very neatly to the topic of uh, the theme of uh, software in the coming five years which i believe is markets justice ethics and law okay so please uh, join me in uh, inviting Thank you. 
I was just um, beginning to wonder how I would arrange the gymnastics of handling a mic like a rock star and reading a text from a printed page and also manipulating my slides. So I'm glad that at least one of those challenges has been removed from me. Um, so good evening. First of all, thank you very much. I am pleased to see that, well, I mean, I don't accept the funereal <laughs> idea at all, especially since you're going up the street, as it were, to start or renew something else. So it's hardly a, an ending. But uh, we did talk at the very beginning, and now it's very interesting to be here in the moment of transition, and um, I hope uh, further interesting collaborations will come both from Van Leer and from here. So thank you for inviting me at the beginning and also at the moment, at the inflection point, I think is the way that we talk about it these days. Uh, and thanks to Professor Blanc for agreeing to serve as commentator. I'm delighted that we can continue the conversation in the fall when you're in my neck of the woods. And last but not least, I'd like to thank um, Tel Aviv Law School for having had me as a visitor here for a couple of weeks, and I've really enjoyed my stay. I'm not uh, totally positive that my students appreciate being guinea pigs uh, of a professor who doesn't quite know how to teach Israeli law students, but I'm learning a lot in the process, and I'll certainly end up being a better experimenter the next time around. Um, and also, I should mention that I've become a far better citizen of the internet world. Uh, I've uh, staunchly resisted Uber and Lyft and all those other things, but I find here that I'm using Get with wild abandon, and I've even downloaded WhatsApp, and one of these days I'll even manage to have an exchange on it instead of just receiving things. The only successful exchange I've had was with my landlady when she was sitting on the sofa next to me, and somehow it worked then, but it was perhaps not the ideal circumstances in which to use this technology to its fullest. All right, so coming to the subject of tonight's talk, um, there is a way in which I've been thinking about this for um, really as, uh, as long as I've been in law school, uh, but another way is to say I've been thinking about it from the birth of what people uh, call neoliberalism. When I started law school, law and economics was still in its infancy. Tragic Choices, the classic work of Guido Calabresi and Philip Bobbitt had not yet been written. Um, but I still remember with bemusement or amusement my introduction to contract law uh, through P.V. House v. Garland, um, an introduction at the same time to the cruel rationality of the law. Uh, here are the, on the slide are the facts and the holding in that contract case involving uh, a mining company that had conducted strip mining in Pennsylvania and then was refusing to fill in the holes in accordance with the contract. And the trial court established that the remedial work would cost more than $29,000 and the value of the farm would thereby increase by $300 alone. Uh, and the court on hearing the appeal said that the $300 is what should stand because it is unlikely that a reasonable landowner would spend $29,000 to increase the value of a piece of land by only $300. Of course, um, by what calculus these amounts were being measured did not enter into the discussion then at all. Fittingly then, my earliest introduction to legal practice was in an environmental law firm where one of the very first assignments I was given was to compare the cost-benefit analysis provisions of major environmental laws. Not then, because I was still too ignorant, but when I embarked on my first serious research project, I wrote as one of my very first published pieces, which I think maybe nobody would be able to find because I think the journal may have gone defunct. But anyway, it was an article called Negotiation or Cost-Benefit Analysis, a Middle Road for US Policy. The piece pointed out that all sorts of decisions that American administrative law accomplishes through elaborate analytic procedures 
producing and relying on stacks of highly technical economic reports was often done in other countries through political negotiation and hardly any analysis at all. I was not yet aware at that time of STS as an analytic field and had no resources with which to think about the things that were already puzzling me. I didn't know then, as I do now, that markets are politics by other means, that both achieve their legitimating effects through illusionistic techniques, that economic transactions make and unmake human subjects, or that law serves as the apparatus through which stagecraft becomes statecraft and illusions are transformed into reality. The intervening years have transformed how I look at my own earlier problematique. I come this evening, therefore, with three sets of concerns that have, for me, become increasingly interlinked, beginning close to home and extending outward. These are with disciplines and interdisciplinarity, justice and the sense of justice, and last, but in a way foremost, the place of critique. The title of tonight's lecture, Subjects of Reason, touches on all three themes, as I hope to show you. I've been working for many years at the intersection of law, my field, as I said, of professional training, and science and technology studies, or STS, the field I've helped to build and which has been my academic home for most of my working life. Connecting these fields has been exciting, but not easy work. The trouble begins with the subject matter of each. In spite of their profoundly important ordering influence on human lives, law and science don't share easy conceptual language to bring together their ways of thought. Uh, the kind of thing you heard from the rector about, I'm just a physicist, so I can't talk about ethics, but then he did proceed to. Uh, but that's the sort of uh, confessional statement that you often hear. I'm just a lawyer. I never learned any science. And, or I'm a scientist, and I don't know about law. There's no buzzword such as rational choice that makes people from economics and political science, for example, feel as if they're speaking the same language, even if in different registers. If there are words at all that connect law to science, they are the profoundly de-skilling terms lag and illiteracy. Oddly, both law and science subscribe equally to a myth of fallenness that hampers productive critical thinking. Law professors, judges, scientists, and the mainstream media all agree that the legal profession's lack of scientific knowledge is a huge barrier to social progress and good governance. Law, on this view, is always lagging because it cannot keep up with the pressures for progress that come always and entirely from the innovative forces of science and technology. In his in 1987, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of the US famously addressed Harvard Law School students about how to attune the law to social ends. It seems to me, he said, that every lawyer ought to seek an understanding of economics. Today, Holmes's wish is almost a bromide. Harvard Law students are busily studying finance and cross-registering with the business school. Some of the old reformist pedagogical zeal has turned instead to the notion of science literacy for lawyers now that economic literacy has been achieved. Such turns of the wheel and what we think professionals need to know is itself a paradigm shift in our intellectual landscape and hence a topic in intellectual history well worth further STS exploration. But to pursue that line would take us far afield from the questions I'd like to raise tonight. Those questions, first and foremost, center on science and law as linked engines that power our ways of being in the world. In competition or in collaboration, law and science shape our sense of what is possible, what is worth doing, and what should be done. Both claim a kind of universalism, and hence are implicated in creating understandings that span political and cultural space. Science renders universally truthful representations of nature, or so it is thought. Law inscribes behaviors on society that are taken to be enduringly natural. Both institutions, too, govern us. One could point around 
this room at any of the objects surrounding us, whether fixed like tables or rotating like chairs or mobile like smartphones and laptops, visible like the lights above us or invisible like the software that is um, enabling my slides. Each in its way, each of these objects has enabled us to come together and to communicate, and each constrains how we conduct our encounter. These devices, these microphones, are built for people who do not wear saris, and I have not yet learned how to get people to understand that maybe things that clip to the right would be equally useful as things that clip to the left. But, you know, this is a campaign that I'm still pursuing. Um, so what is more important um, that is that each of these objects that govern us is at the same time a product of science, a product of law, and especially for tonight's purposes, also a product of economics. As citizens of the modern technological world, we are in this sense subjects of our own scientific, legal, and technological ingenuity as tool makers and as rule makers and increasingly, the boundaries between rules and tools is not nearly so important as the work that these do together. Strangely, STS is of less help than one might think in filling the intellectual gap between law and science. STS scholars have done massive amounts of work to uncover the hybridity and heterogeneity of a world reconfigured by humans in an era now fashionably called the Anthropocene. In the process, STS has made most high-sounding things, such as truth, objectivity, expertise, and even reason, seem quite mundane. Anybody could do it. Anybody could be an expert. A standard analytic move in STS is to say, don't ask what a thing is or means. Ask what makes it work and what had to be done to make it so. Justice Holmes intent on turning doctrinal law into practical economics would surely have approved of that pragmatic turn. But despite all of STS's cleverness in revealing the hybrid heterogeneous networks that sustain us, um, this is a famous diagram of Bruno Latour, often taken to be synonymous with SDS studies. Despite all of our histories of how things travel, how black boxes are not really black inside, and how the illusion of scientific and technological purity is made and sustained, there remain issues that law concerns, concerns itself with that are not so easily made mundane or material. There are, to be sure, technological dimensions to many policy questions we confront, because in a world on the move, science and technology fuel many of our actions and transactions, both locally and globally. We have, for instance, designed currencies and financial instruments that sustain virtual, even fantastical worlds of exchange, credit default swaps, Bitcoin, the euro. How they perform their illusionistic magic or fail to do so, as in the current crisis of the Eurozone, is a topic addressed by STS scholars interested in the market itself as a technological space and as a product of financial instruments. But there is a justice dimension, too, to almost all of the questions of our high-tech world that standard STS approaches capture less well. What do we owe to the losers of technological revolutions? And what place, if any, do they have in conversations between industries and their imagined stakeholders in a period of so-called disruptive invention or innovation? What new solidarities are being made and unmade in all of our technologically mediated creativity? And what happens to ancient lines of power and responsibility and who can be held accountable for redress when things go wrong. Not everybody has a redress number. I've always wondered what that number would do if you plugged it into these forms. I want then to set at the center of my inquiry the questions of justice and global governance in a modernity that we see as the communal work product of science, technology, and law. This is a world in which things are continuously fluid, 
in which connections between space and matter and even time refuse to abide by old rules of stability and sustainability. Human bodies, for example, are on the move as never before and not only as refugees, deconstructed through the representational languages of biology and information Bodies themselves have become multiple and mutable. Their attributes available for sale, storage, mining, and recombination through the convergent technologies of the day. Chemicals move through air and water, making the climate change. Ice sheets are melting their waters into rising oceans. Data whizzes through digital space. Financial exchanges connect and destabilize continents. The discourse of the 1990s of the waning of the sovereign state hardly seems adequate to capture the overlapping mobilities of the chaotic present. In this welter of forces, what has happened to the age-old concerns of social and political thought? Who are we? What are our entitlements? How can we defend them? What is the good and how do we know it? Depressingly, the answer all too often seems to be a kind of fatalistic shrugging of the shoulders. Instead of being subjects with agency who can demand reason from those in power, we seem to have become subjects of reason, ruled by the impersonal forces of scientific rationality that set bounds on what good futures we can ask for, whether good is defined in terms of carbon footprints, social security, or educational entitlements. Autonomy is lost, integrity fragmented, the forces of capital and disciplining institutions are just too strong. Critique itself seems useless, driven out of academia by the demands of audit, utility, and impact. So I want to suggest a different vision. It's true that we function today under the governing force of institutions that way, go way beyond the nation state or even those state-like institutions of school, prison, and hospital whose disciplining gaze Michel Foucault so cogently brought to our attention. But the very webs of reason that constrain our actions today themselves open up new spaces of critique. By understanding how we got into them, how we wove and entrapped ourselves into these bonds of seeming inevitability, we can also discern new forms of intervention, places where law can be applied and its very purposes rethought. That, I would submit, is a worthy task for STS and for law. You'll notice I'm saying law rather than ethics, but obviously the two. Uh, go together in a kind of coupling. Indeed, for all of us who wish to be constructive crit critics of the human condition and who came into this world with a taste and thirst for bettering it. So let's move on to the case studies I want to talk about. Let's begin by briefly historicizing the globalization of the present, the global governance of the subtitle. Um, human beings being on the move is nothing new. Human societies have been globalizing for millennia. Migration routes mapped by genetic fingerprints show our ancestors leaving Africa some 70,000 years ago and settling eventually into the farthest corners of the earth. Maps of language families tell similar stories. Here is one of the Indo-European diffusion from somewhere near the Caspian Sea to India in the east and eventually Ireland in the west. Compared with these histories, the age of exploration of the 15th to the 17th century is not merely recent, but a blink in time. It is also Eurocentric in its imagination and in the archival records it left. But it laid the roots for connecting human bodies to territories through law, through the constitutional idea of subjects and sovereignty, citizenship, and nationhood. Clearly, when people talk about globalization being a recent phenomenon, we should qualify those assertions with deeper historical understanding. And yet, as in all matters of history, there are ruptures as well as continuities. Contemporary globalization differs from its historical precedents, not so much in the fact of people and things moving around. That, as we see, is ancient news, but in the forms of subjectivity that are created or remade in those movements. 
The anthropologist Arjun Apadurai called attention to these shifts in his work on imaginaries, uh, set out in overlapping flows of people, money, communications, ideas, and technologies. Both science and law can be seen in Apadurai's scheme of things as simply part of what he called ideascapes. But that would miss out, I think, on the profoundly constitutive function that both institutions work. Science's role, mediated and unmediated by technology, in affecting our sense of possibility and our hopes and visions of, the, of good and attainable futures, what I have elsewhere called sociotechnical imaginaries, and law's role in making us into the kinds of people we want to be. Contemporary globalization from this standpoint is new because it affects human beings who are creatures ruled as much by knowledge of the world as by ideas of lawfulness and by accompanying physical and economic needs. It is, this, it is of this subject and this kind of subjectivity that I'd like to speak for the remainder of the talk. I want to approach the topic of subjectivity through examples that are not usually drawn together because they're lodged in different areas of law that are each international, but otherwise diverge in their topic of concern. These are environment, trade, and intellectual property. First, I want to show as an STS scholar how similar dynamics of fact and artifact making are at play in each of these domains. Each entails some very basic moves that go by well-known thematic names in STS. First, demarcation, or how do we know where a category begins and ends? And second, similarity difference judgments, how do we tell like from unlike, and indeed equate like with like? Both sets of moves are central to the law, just as they are foundational to science. One could not achieve one of the prime mandates of the law, in effect, its Hippocratic Oath, treat like cases alike, without making demarcation and similarity difference judgments. Neither, however, could scientists perform the platonic function of cutting nature at the joints without knowing where the joints are, demarcation, and how one kind of object resembles another, similarity difference judgments, what things, in short, belong to the same kind. Second, and this is the more unusual move, I want to show how notions of legal and political subjectivity are implicated in each of the disputes I'll discuss in more detail. Here we return to my central thematic, the constitution of subjects of reason, and by extension, the critical opportunities open to us once we see how subjectivity and reason are built together, or in my terms, co-produced. My first case concerns climate change with the attendant metaphysical moves that have turned our invisible air into a homeland for itinerant greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, and our financial world into a marketplace where we can trade in impalpable carbon. Air is paradoxical. On the one hand, it stands for things we are least able to touch or see or feel, the very epitome of nothingness, as when the entire fictive world of the tempest with its cloud-capped towers and its gorgeous palaces melts into air, into thin air. At the same time, air has been a site of intense human activity for more than a century, a time of collaboration between science and law, during which we have peopled this most insubstantial medium with things that we have also called upon the law to regulate. A visitor to Berlin in the summer of 2005 would have noticed a new sign in buses comprising part of the city's impeccable transportation system. Berlin atmet auf, declared the decals on many bus windows. Wir ziehen Feinstaub aus dem Verkehr. Somewhat freely translated, Berlin breathes free. We draw fine particulates out of traffic or maybe out of circulation. That public transport should advertise itself as good for public health is not altogether surprising, and the contribution of vehicular traffic to urban air pollution hardly needs comment. But what is this entity Feinstaub that in 2005 all Berliners were expected to recognize at a glance? How did it come to occupy their conceptual world so completely? And is it, in the philosopher Ian Hacking's terms, a thing in nature, 
a natural kind, or a thing in society, an interactive or social kind. Hacking, as you may know, is a constructivist who happily concedes that the objects and ideas disclosed through science have histories, and yet he is also a realist who believes that nature at some point takes over. Natural kinds, like particulates, are simply there. So, as he once said, the idea of quarks may have a history, but, and I quote, quarks, the, quarks, the objects themselves, are not constructs, are not social, are not historical. Natural kinds, like quarks, are indifferent to us and what we may think about them. As he, Hacking continued, calling a quark a quark makes no difference to the quark. They bear none of their history about them. They just are. Feinstaub, or its US equivalent fine particulates, also have a history, and the origins of that history can be traced to law. In 1970, Congress enacted the Clean Air Act, the first and most significant environmental law um, that uh, initiated an immense decade-long architectural project that brought the edifice of environmental law into being. A central provision of the act was the decision to set standards for so-called criteria air pollution at levels designed to protect public health with ample margins of safety. There was no provision for weighing the health benefits of clean air standards against the costs to industry for complying with those standards. Foiled in its attempts to read a cost-benefit test into law, industry chose to fight the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, whose remit includes the Clean Air Act, on scientific grounds. Fine particulates emerged from the epic 30-year conflict between EPA's efforts to clean the air and industry's attempts to set the terms in which EPA might define what counts as clean air. The Clean Air Act asks EPA to set national ambient air quality standards for so-called criteria pollutants. These include suspended particulate matter, the invisible present-day descendants of the suspended soot that produced killer fogs in the first half of the 20th century. By the 1990s, EPA was aware of a public health problem that seemed not to improve despite all attempts to improve the quality of urban air. This was the increase of respiratory illness, such as asthma, especially among inner city dwellers. The agency and its scientific experts set out to identify the reasons. One result was the so-called Six Cities study conducted by researchers at Harvard School of Public Health. This ambitious epidemiological study found that the likely agent of the nation's growing respiratory distress was an actor or as some STS scholars like to say, an actant that had hitherto escaped the discerning eye of the regulatory state, fine particulate matter. In its subsequent revision of the ambient standard for ozone and particulate matter, EPA included a new provision relating to fine particulates, triggering an all-out attack by the polluting industries. So let me emphasize, fine particulates did not exist. They had no ontological reality until EPA, in the course of trying to trace how people were still getting asthma in spite of a couple of decades of trying to clean the air, found these things, defined them, set a micron size around them, and then proceeded to build regulations on how to deal with them. Needless to say, the current president of the United States cannot see these objects and would be inclined to say they do not exist. But, you know, this is the nature of ontological politics. The ensuing legal battle battles focused on a single existential question. Should fine particulates exist at all as a kind of entity that EPA or the publics it seeks to protect should care about? If sufficient doubt could be cast on their causal role in air pollution, uh, in air pollution-related disease, then there would be no need to think of the air as continuing these particular items suspended within it. Plato thought that philosophy's job was to find nature's joints and cut it apart accordingly. If the six cities study did not hold up, there would be no need to demarcate nature along the particular joint represented by the entities those studies had created. 
the very rationale for fine particulates would cease to exist. They could go the way of other now forgotten aerial things like phlogiston. So if we don't care about asthma or the rise in asthma among inner city people or believe that inner city people are suffering more than others, there would be no fine particulates. There is a kind of should question, should we care about certain kinds of things? And following that should question has given rise to an is in the world, namely the construction of these agents that nobody can see, but that we nevertheless regulate. So it would take too long to rehearse in detail the legal and procedural battles played out on this issue. EPA won for a certain period of time, though the present US administration calls the quality of that victory into question with a systematic erasure of the word science, the capability for doing science out of EPA. So, you know, we're facing a different world. EPA was vindicated in the Supreme Court by one of the most collegial opinions to come out of a deeply divided Supreme Court in recent <coughs> years. Some half dozen years later, in the 2007 decision of Massachusetts versus EPA, a challenge to the EPA's refusal to act on global warming, the court divided again along its now usual ideological lines. Justice Antonin Scalia's comments in oral argument and eventually in dissent illustrate how the dispute centered on a particular vision of law and governance arrived at through key demarcations and like versus unlike judgments. Technically, the case raised two main issues. Did the state of Massachusetts have legal standings to sue the EPA on the issue of global warming? And was EPA justified in its refusal to treat greenhouse gases as air pollutants under the Clean Air Act? So you'll notice here an asymmetry. EPA was recognizing fine particulates, but greenhouse gases were not an ontology that EPA was lining up behind. Um, Justice Scalia squarely addressed what entities are like and unlike in his response to the second issue. In the oral argument on the case, he tried to draw a distinction between air pollution, plainly regulated by the Clean Air Act in its very terms, and global warming, which he suggested was an effect on an atmospheric system that was not the same as air. An exchange with James R. Milkey, Assistant Attorney General of Massachusetts, captures Scalia's thinking. And so I quote some of the relevant bits. Mr. Milkey, I had, my problem is precisely on the impermissible grounds. To be sure, carbon dioxide is a pollutant and it can be an air pollutant. If we fill this room with carbon dioxide, it could be an air pollutant that endangers health. But I always thought an air pollutant was something different from a stratospheric pollutant. And your claim here is not that the pollution of what we normally call air is endangering health. Mr. Milky says respectfully, Your Honor, it's not the stratosphere, it's the troposphere. Justice Scalia says, troposphere, whatever. I told you before I'm not a scientist. You see what I mean about the two discourses not talking to one another. Uh, that's why he continued after the laughter. Uh, that's why I don't want to have to deal with global warming to tell you the truth. Mr. Milky carries on under the express words of the statute and so forth. Uh, um, and this is 302G. For something to be an air pollutant, it has to be emitted into the ambient air or otherwise entered there. And Scalia, yes, and I agree with that. It is when it comes out, it is when it comes out an air pollutant. But is it an air pollutant that endangers health? I think it has to endanger health by reason of polluting the air, and this does not endanger health by reason of polluting the air at all. I hope Mary Douglas is turning in her grave. Um, when the Supreme Court rendered its five to four split decision in favor of the petitioners, that is in favor of Massachusetts et al., Scalia filed a separate dissent. He again insisted on the plain meaning of the act which in his view put global warming outside the domain of air pollution. 
So these things were just not like, they were unlike, and he was making a demarcation. Not surprisingly, his earlier mistake about the meaning of troposphere and his admission of his lack of scientific knowledge made no appearance in the written opinion. Um, this is why you should all make a habit or practice of going to the oral arguments that are uh, now widely available. Instead, Scalia relied on the dictionary and its monopoly on establishing the plain meaning of words. We need no, look no further than the dictionary, he said, for confirmation that this interpretation of air pollution is eminently reasonable. And going on, he said, EPA's conception of air pollution, focusing on impurities in the ambient air at ground level or near the surface of the earth is perfectly consistent with the natural meaning of that term. So EPA is justified in ignoring greenhouse gases because they are not polluting the near to earth surface and it is fair to think that what Congress meant was ambient air and not uh, the stuff that goes higher up and becomes a uh, tropospheric um, uh, hazard. Advocates for a more proactive US climate policy rejoiced that Scalia's arguments did not carry the day. But it's important to recognize that what was at stake for the justice were questions of sovereignty and subjectivity that went beyond the circumstances of the case. Paraphrased, Scalia's dissent focused on which system of thought should govern when injunctions seem to collide. The, the expert, but unelected and extra constitutional authority of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which had declared binding truths about the climate, or the US Congress's democratically rat ratified use of words with plain meanings accessible to ordinary people, including non-scientists like himself. How one form of pollution or one composition of air gets understood for legal and policy purposes depends on the answer to that question, a question of global governance. So does the issue of what kinds of human subjects we are, how we understand the risks and benefits of our world, and which institutions and discourses we can turn to in times of distress. Interestingly, on the other side of the world, just this kind of question had been raised, albeit in very different terms. In their 1991 manifesto, Global Warming in an Unequal World, Anil Agarwal, the founder of India's influential Center for Science and Environment, and his then associate and later successor, Sunita Narayan, had also argued against the right of unelected expert bodies to declare the state of nature in ways that take away people's right to determine the conditions of their own subjectivity. Predating Scalia's contentions by almost two decades, Agarwal and Narayan also argued against recognizing all carbon everywhere as the same for purposes of creating uniform regulations and markets. They took the position that carbon should be distinguished from other carbon on the basis of the circumstances that produce the element's diffusion into air. Luxury emissions of the rich, they proposed, should not be treated as equivalent to the subsistence emissions of the poor. At stake for them, as for Scalia, still years and continents away, were questions about who lays down the ground rules of political subjectivity. Just what kind of pol politics or morality is this, they asked, which masquerades in the name of one-worldism and high-minded internationalism. On the cover of their report, they featured the famous Yo Amigo cartoon that has since come to stand for the proposition that carbon is not necessarily carbon for purposes of climate policy. If concerns for justice enter the picture, then we will draw up a different constitution for the one world afflicted by climate change, a constitution in which the poor too would be allowed to speak in high places. At COP21 in Paris in December 2015, meeting in the wake of a major terrorist tragedy, the French government banned public demonstrations in the interests of maintaining security. Activists gathered at the Place de la République to display in the mute symbolism of paired shoes their inability to express themselves as citizens of the world. When I showed this picture at the time to my Harvard students and asked what they what it made them think of. 
Many mentioned the Holocaust. Some spoke about shoes left outside of mosques. One said there were no wheelchairs for the disabled. But none of my two dozen extremely smart students noted that the barefoot billions of the world were by definition not at this Republican gathering, including the poor of whom Agarwal and Narayan had asked, do these people have a right to live? But this is not a question that today's G7 would agree deserves attentiveness either. Let me talk about my two other cases in slightly briefer fashion, not because they don't deserve detailed reflection, but in the interests of time. My second example comes from trade law and has to do with genetically modified crops before the World Trade Organization. Trade cases are heaven sent for the kind of STS analysis I'm proposing, in the first instance because trade, trading regimes so centrally depend on making sameness different, difference judgments when determining that governments may not discriminate in favor of their own products. Um, oh, this is about the G7 and why I think they're not going to listen to those arguments particularly easily. His views are evolving. He came here to learn. He came here to get smarter. That's Trump's spokesperson. But turning to the trading regime, are all these things the same product equivalents? Of course, it, it leads, the trading regime has led to a lot of ingenuity in product differentiation, but the basic principle remains that like commodities must be treated alike when deciding whether or not they may freely move across national borders. On May 13, 2003, the United States, Canada, and Argentina filed an action against the European Union for maintaining an illegal moratorium against American-made genetically modified organisms. Along with four colleagues, I decided we should run an experiment in global governance. In fact, global democracy, you might say. Could we, as social scientists from elite Western institutions, get the ear of a global governing body? Could we, as citizen experts, hold the WTO accountable to expert knowledge that we believed was highly relevant to our case, and yet in danger of being ignored by the parties as well as the WTO's dispute resolution panel? In particular, we wanted to make the WTO aware of the socially constructed character of risk assessment and to adjust its dispute resolution practices accordingly. The biotech products dispute arose under the Agreement on Technical Barriers to Trade, or the TBT Agreement, and the Agreement on the Application of Sanitary and Phytosanitary Standards, the SPS Agreement. Both agreements acknowledge that national governments may legitimately restrict the import of products from other countries if those products threaten their citizens' health and safety. Both provisions, however, also stipulate that exceptions must be justified through risk assessment. The relevant treaty language represents risk assessment as impersonal and judgment-free and hence as an objective basis for policy. This is consistent with US understandings of risk assessment as sound science capable of producing a universal translocal form of objectivity. Statements by high-level US politicians left no doubt that the United States was concerned about much more than the economic consequences of the EU's reluctance to import GMOs, GM crops. Centrally implicated as well was the American approach to decision-making a threat to the concept of sound regulatory science that underwrote the safety of products made in the United States. In other words, people, I think American politicians recognized that it was important to get other people to buy into America's risk assessment strategies as a precondition for products to be given non-discriminatory treatment. American officials intuitively grasped that GM crops would circulate freely in world trade only if the scientific assessments that supported them also enjoyed universal acceptance. These had to be placed, as it were, hors de combat. I once heard Secretary of State Madeleine Albright assert how Europeans were rejecting not only GM imports, but also science. She said, but science does not support the frankenfood fears of some, particularly outside the United States, that biotech food or other products will harm human health. 
This is a position that US scientists and decision makers continue to assert until um, this very day. Procedurally then, the dispute went before the WTO's dispute settlement body, the DSB. This is the WTO's general counsel consisting of ambassadorial representatives of member state governments meeting together as the DSB. After required attempts at consultation and mediation, the DSB, through a closed process, appoints an ad hoc dispute settlement panel to review the case, consult with appropriate experts, and prepare a preliminary report. Unless an appeal is filed, the DSB adopts the report, which then becomes final. And then there are other procedures if an appeal is filed. So the dispute settlement panel in the biotech products case took almost three years to reach its conclusion. It then issued a 1,050-page interim report, and it was accepted as the final report in November of 2006. There is no process that allows parties other than the disputing national governments into the dispute settlement process and the trading regime. At the time of our filing, the WTO website indicated that amicus briefs by third parties were a contested issue, and there was no formal procedure for filing them. In part, the lack of agreement reflected the multiplicity of legal cultures represented at the WTO. Amicus briefs are recognized forms of intervention in common law systems, such as that of the United States, but they have no comparable status in civil law. Accordingly, the WTO did not officially sanction the practice, but left it up to each dispute settlement panel in a given case to decide whether or not to accept amicus submissions. My colleagues and I were convinced that the US position on sound science did not stand up to scholarly scrutiny. As contributors to the social studies of risk, we wanted to communicate the deeply judgmental and culturally situated character of the so-called science of risk analysis. Our team consisted of two trained lawyers, two sociologists, and a prominent British environmentalist and policy advisor who was also at that time a professor at Lancaster University. We had no material resources other than our modest research budgets, and so we met at Lancaster, the Americans traveling on their own means, and the British team members offering hospitality and a room rented at almost no cost from the Lancaster Friends Meeting House for us to work in. They also brought a supply of tea and biscuits so we could work together carefully. So our problem was twofold. In a field without transparent practices, especially for non-state actors, could we nevertheless intervene as if we were acting in a procedurally legitimate matter, manner? And could we hope to gain recognition as knowledge bearers who should be heard in a domain where social science expertise seemed profoundly at odds with policy decisions, political interests, and even the language of the international agreements? in short, with the governing law. On the first point, we found invaluable allies among a shadow network of non-governmental practitioners who were united by a common desire to open up the WTO's much criticized and non-transparent modes of operation. On the second point, we had to compromise, translating our expertise and epistemic concerns into terms that the dispute settlement panel might accept as sufficiently legal and thus allow us into its deliberations. Our record ultimately was one of mixed and rather limited success and failure. Success in inserting a new text into the body of materials that the panel and to some extent the parties accepted and officially acknowledged failure in disrupting the dominant global discourse around the objectivity of policy-relevant science. Advised by experienced trade lawyers, environmental NGOs, and knowledgeable individuals at the Center for International Environmental Law, we notified the parties in advance of our desire to submit a brief, and we eventually sent the brief to the WTO with the support of the EU. Privately, persons working in the EU's legal and policy offices assured us that our brief had been read and noticed and had made an impression. Publicly, the panel report made only footnoted references to our brief, which they referred to as that of a group of university professors, in all of its thousand plus pages. The footnotes 
said, one of them said, in the course of these proceedings, we received three unsolicited, unsolicited amicus curiae briefs, and one of them was on 6 May 2004, we received an amicus curiae brief from a group of university professors. That was the way we were characterized. Uh, and the second one was, we note, the second footnote said, we note that a panel has the discretionary authority either to accept and consider or to reject any information submitted to it. In this case, we accepted the information submitted by the amici. So it was a kind of procedural victory that they didn't just shove the thing off of their desk. The panel concluded in summary that the EU had violated the SPS agreement by failing to complete approval procedures without undue delay. In addition, several individual member states had also violated the agreement by adopting discriminatory measures that, in defiance of Article 2, were not based on scientific principles of risk assessment and thus maintained without sufficient scientific evidence. A footnote listed us by name. That was our moment of glory. Formally, our brief was accepted by the panel, received a docket number that gave it official status. Informally, it circulated as part of the material culture of knowledge making in which individual items may eventually join up to produce unexpected effects. It did appear as an article in the Yale Journal of International Law and is one of my more cited pieces. Um, so it has achieved a certain kind of academic blessing. But as political subjects wishing to break open a legally and politically sanctioned position on the nature of scientific risk assessment, we found ourselves in a distinctly subaltern position as two footnotes in history. My third example concerns intellectual property law, especially as developed in connection with generic drugs. The centerpiece of this story is a lawsuit in India involving the anti-cancer drug Gleevec manufactured by the Swiss pharmaceutical giant Novartis. Indian firms began making and marketing the generic version of Gleevec, a crystalline form of the compound imatinib, before the formulation of the TRIPS agreement as part of international trade law and at a time when India did not authorize any patents of, on pharmaceuticals. So you know that before TRIPS, a lot of developing countries exempted pharmaceutical drugs from intellectual property protection on the grounds that this was about public health, which ought to be accessible to everybody, should not be constrained by patents. So once, um, Indian firms in that period began making and marketing the generic version of Gleevec. Um, uh, and uh, later, when uh, the TRIPS agreement required India to pass a new national law, Novartis filed for a patent on its version of the drug, which would have knocked the generic out of the market. In particular, it would have raised the price of the generic, sorry, of the drug 10 times higher than the available generic, thereby taking it out of reach for most Indian patients. In 2013, the Indian Supreme Court held that Gleevec did not meet Section 3D of India's new Patent Act, which guards against patent renewals based on minor improvements that do not confer added therapeutic benefits, a practice commonly known as evergreening. In the court's opinion, Novartis had failed to show that the new form of Gleevec was any more efficacious than cheaper off-patent versions already on the market. The case took shape during a period when the Indian government was assimilating its existing patent protections to TRIPS. Novartis had applied for a patent on Gleevec twice with somewhat different product specifications. These exact circumstances are unlikely to be repeated for many other drugs. Yet the Supreme Court went out of its way to underscore the non-neutrality of patent law, the close connection between political values and intellectual property protection, and the consequent mismatch between the ethical demands of developed and developing countries with respect to intellectual property. The court cited with apparent approval a 1957 report on patent reform authored by another judge. And they said, Justice Iyengar observed that the provisions of the patent law 
have to be designed with special reference to the economic conditions of the country, the state of its scientific and technological advancement, its future needs, and other relevant factors, and so as to minimize, if not to eliminate, the abuses to which a system of patent monopoly is capable of being put. So what he was presenting was, in effect, a kind of STS critique of the presumed universalism of the theories of innovation that underpin patent law. Novartis lost its case before the Indian Supreme Court to much hand-wringing in the US news media. The decision settled the patentability of Gleevec in India, but it left open a larger ethical question. How much variance between national patent systems is warranted if one accepts Justice Iyengar's contention that intellectual property law is not value-free, but articulates the political and economic preferences of particular nations or regions. One indication of possible ways forward came in September 2014 when Gilead Sciences, the California-based maker of a costly drug for treating hepatitis C, signed a license with seven Indian manufacturers of generic drugs to produce a stratified global pricing system. Under that agreement, Gilead would sell its drug in India for $10 per pill, 100 the price of the that the company charges in the US. In return, Indian manufacturers would pay a licensing fee to Gilead, but continue marketing their generic versions in poor countries where patients would never be able to afford the higher priced pills. This, however, was an ad hoc private agreement between pharmaceutical companies in two countries without legal or precedential value for other drugs, firms, or patient populations. One aspect of the Gleevec decision merits explicit attention in connection with the theme of this lecture. The Indian courts had to consider whether the Gleevec formulation for which Novartis was seeking a patent was the same as or different from one for which the patent had already expired. In deciding against Novartis on this point, the court held that the relevant demarcation criterion was increased benefit, not ease of delivery into bodies or any other technical improvement. This dispensation called attention to the uneven power that allows pharmaceutical companies to engage in evergreening, greening, claiming differences between drug variants and thereby influencing judgments as to when innovation has really occurred. Yet distinctive differences among human subjects, such as the ability to play, pay, are not part of the drug company's patenting policy. In a conversation with a Novartis lawyer, I was told that the Gleevec decision was a disaster for India because no one, not even domestic companies, would invest in a context that left their fortunes so unsettled and vulnerable. I suppose we shall see. Let me take a few final minutes to draw together the themes from these cases and tie them back to the concerns I laid out at the beginning. We stand today arguably at a constitutional moment no less momentous than the one marked by the age of revolutions at the end of the 18th and first part of the 19th centuries. The watchword then was liberty, and people knew very clearly whose yoke they wanted to shed. America's Declaration of Independence is a highly personal bill of attainder, a list of grievances against a monarch who had fallen short, as the authors saw it, of meeting his constitutional obligations to his subjects. In today's age of hyper-rationality, the sovereigns are paradoxically more distant, and we as subjects often don't even recognize how we are ruled by others' reasons. But the yearning for voice and representation lives on as a universal. All three cases I've discussed indicate that the doors of the law are not easily opened to new ways of reasoning that challenge established precedent or practice. But the desire for voice and rep sorry, but the um, but the desire for representation is stronger even than the disciplining forces of science and technology, and ultimately the urge for democratic self-expression must have an impact on ideas of subjectivity and lawful global governance. During the 2014 People's Climate March in New York, a photograph by Joshua Bright in the New York Times showed a little girl dressed in yellow with a white sash, 
carried on a man's shoulder, waving aloft in one arm a baton with an orange banner. In color and composition, the photograph bore an uncanny resemblance to Eugène Delacroix's famous painting that you saw on the previous slide. Only this time, the figure of hope arose from the legions of the young whose lives will be most affected by the changing climate. Perhaps this child's banner, too, can be seen as a latter-day oriflamme, the symbol of fierce commitment carried into battle by the medieval kings of France. At any rate, the picture invites us to recall that the spaces of critique remain as open and expansive as the face of the planet. Our task, as citizens, STS scholars, or legal advocates, is to occupy the Earth's innumerable beckoning streets in search of just ways to refashion the law. Thank you. microphone while I detach myself from this one. Um. Thank you so much. Um, and first of all, uh, thanks um, to uh, Professor Schlepp for uh, uh, having honored us um, in the celebration of the um, fifth anniversary of the South Center. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Shaila Z uh, for a wonderful five years. Thank you for the enriched our Oh, it's for the camera. Uh -huh. So that was the right side, left-hand side that you were talking about. Now I see. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, and first of all, I, again, so I just want to um, thank Professor Jessena for her um, wonderful, inspiring talk and um, for the great privilege that I have um, to comment on her talk, um, which is both timely and a historical. Uh, in the lessons that it teaches us um, about, of course, the more timely relationship between technology, science, law, um, but also about the more ahistorical and even um, eternal um, role that citizens uh, need to play and must play in a polity if it is to remain a democracy. Um, so thanks for uh, these wonderful lessons. Um, more concretely, um, Professor Jesenoff um, has talked to us about the cage of reason um, that we have uh, erected to ourselves. Um, of course, the Weberian and a Foucauldian um, theme um, that um, she has so eloquently uh, and beautifully demonstrated that is still um, operating. Um, and yet, um, I think that um, one of the main themes uh, that we have just heard um, that um, as cage-like um, as reason uh, seems to be there are still venues um, for uh, resistance and venues for critique, a critique that uh, Professor Jessenoff calls a constructive critique. That is a critique that doesn't settle just for the demonstration um, of the constructedness um, of, uh, of the objects and of the subjects, um, but also of what can be done um, about that. And I think that perhaps the most um, surprising but also pleasant um, things for us lawyers, uh, and us is including, of course, Professor Jasanov, who also uh, holds a JD, um, um, is that um, hope lies actually in law. Um, so both three cases actually demonstrate um, that um, perhaps in other um, scholarly works, she has uh, emphasized the works of scientists, um, but in this talk, um, the emphasis on, is on law. All three cases actually demonstrate um, that, um, that hope lies uh, not um, where Halderlin says uh, danger lies, um, but where law is. Um, so in the Supreme Court uh, and the EPA, uh, in the WTO and the genetically modified um, foods, uh, and in the Indian court, 
Um, all these cases are actually cases in which resistance um, and an attempt to reclaim citizenship, as you call it, um, actually happens through the courts of law and through the legal um, um, domain. It doesn't mean that all, not all, that all of them are successful, but it means that we can try um, and are always called um, um, for an attempt. Um, now, since I don't have a lot of time, I will um, um, kind of try to limit myself um, to some of the points that were raised. And again, since the talk um, was so rich and so uh, um, um, filled with, with many details and many, many uh, different uh, issues, I would just like to highlight um, several points that uh, provoked me um, to further think about, about the um, theoretical scheme that Professor Jessenoff um, 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 afforded us. Um, and I would like to begin with uh, we kind of thinking about the name, um, which is the subject of reason. Um, and and um, and what I um, kind of again my first point um, would actually like to think about the subjects of unreason, um, and and I think that again this kind of uh, um, opposition between the reason and unreason plays a role um, that runs throughout um, the talk that we have just heard. Um, so in the face of it, um, we're locked in the system, um, as Professor Jessen have said, um, of an ever-growing um, reason. Um, in which we are subject um, or subjugated, we can say, um, to these forms of reason. Again, a theme um, in which the growing um, uh, hold or sway of the various disciplines, um, you've emphasized economy, um, at least at the earlier um, stages of your talk, um, but we can think about other disciplines as well. Of course, this is science or risk assessment. These are statistics. Harder sciences and, and softer sciences, it seems that um, um, for, for uh, Professor Jessenoff and definitely for some of the STS scholars, all of them would count um, as the sciences that are um, exposed to the critique. Um, so all of them um, seem to, again, kind of subject us. Instead of us ruling them, they begin to rule us. Um, but on the other hand, um, the other, I would say, complaint um, or critique that, that was running through your talk was that there was not enough reason, so to speak, um, or not enough science. There is a moment, um, um, and I think it's a very important moment, where um, you and your, your scientist uh, friends um, um, are trying to actually attack the risk assessment um, of, um, of the um, of of the, of the uh, American kind of industry trying to uh, critique um, the limitations that the Europeans are putting on genetically modified foods. Um, and there, actually, your claim is that it, was, um, it, was, um, it wouldn't hold um, scholarly um, scrutiny, um, which means, of course, and it is not a thing that, that STS denies, nor, nor that Professor Jasanov denies, that there is such a thing as a scholarly um, scrutiny, which means actually that we're not in, in the realm of too much reason, but so to speak in the realm of too little reason, in the, in the realm um, in which actually we're just operating from within, um, and by operating within, not even really critiquing it from, um, from without or not trashing the entire endeavor, but rather actually uh, fortifying it by saying this is, um, I wouldn't say junk science, maybe you would be able to actually say that it was real junk science what, what the risk assessments were doing, but definitely launching a powerful scientific critique um, of that. Um, but, uh, but going again to the theme of the, of the reason and, and unreason, um, I also want to, again, kind of tie it more um, to our contemporary uh, political situation um, in which we are, um, I would say, attacked um, by, by the very, um, I would say, almost um, um, horrors um, of, the, of the radical critique of science, um, which is the, um, that it's just nothing, so to speak. Um, so, so, of course, the Trumpian um, trope or, or the Trumpian Trump um, um, of, um, of junking science uh, altogether, um, and I know that you're also going to talk about that um, at the Van Leer Institute on Friday about the post and truth. Um, and actually, I'm just, I can't wait. Uh, and Professor Eslachi is actually going to also be the respondent. Um, and, and I was actually, as I was reading, I was thinking, how would we put that um, alongside um, with, uh, um, with this um, piece? Um, and I will go back to that um, in the end, where I would want to say, um, or actually put, um, put on the table a question um, of how do we treat 
unreason, so to speak, um, in our politics and, and also in our science. Um, so just to quickly move to another um, 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 point. So the subjects that, um, that Professor Jasanoff is talking about um, are, are subjects of reason, but as I said, they are also subjects of unreason, and also they are subjects of other, um, of other things. They are subjects of power, they are subjects of market and economy, they are subjects of globalization, and they are subjects of law. And when Professor Jesenov talks about uh, subjects, um, these are not the powerful or the self-deciding subjects, but actually it's a reversal of the term. As I suggested before, they are subjected by these different um, realms. So it's a subject object, if you will, in which the subject position, more than it is the agent or moral agent subject, it is more the object of the various um, discipline. Um, and I think that for all of them, actually, um, there is kind of this um, flipping that on one hand, um, they are the subjects of too much globalization or, or, globalization or too much law, but also the reverse. So just to put, um, again, these two examples, which are very important because both globalization and the legal sphere are important in the, um, in the paper that uh, Professor Jesenov was just delivering. The first is globalization. So on one hand, of course, what we have um, is a notion of globalization um, in the sense that, um, that there is perhaps too much. Um, in what sense there is too much? In the sense, again, uh, perhaps of a growing economization um, of, a lot of, the, um, of the, a lot of the travel. Um, so it is no longer just perhaps the linguistic travel that, um, that we have seen uh, dating back to uh, dozens of thousands of years um, ago. It is more the economic globalization um, in which it seems um, that there is too much. Um, India might suffer from that once India actually enters into the TRIPS agreement. Um, it subjects itself again to a regime um, that, um, um, that of course, um, again, Luckily for, for the plaintiffs in, in the case of Novartis, they were able to still uh, manage to, um, to resist the, the evergreening of Novartis. But on the other hand, of course, it subjected India to a more stringent economic regime. But on the other hand, there is also too little globalization. And these kind of too little globalization emerges, I think, in the strong critique that, um, um, that, uh, that Professor Jason has also uh, kind of only mentioned in passing, um, which are the migrants um, and the other and the refugee crisis, um, which actually is the other side, which says, if we had more globalization in the sense of allowing um, free movement, not just of goods and not just of, um, of the economy um, or the markets, but also of persons, um, we would have been better off. Um, and one last thing um, with this kind of too much, too little, um, in the description of, um, of the legal sphere, um, so um, I was really taken by, um, by the um, by the way that Professor Jesenov describes the relationship between law and technology or law in general um, and other domains, um, which is the, um, the myth of fallenness. So the law always falls uh, behind, the law lags behind. We all know this kind of talk um, in which um, a lot of the both lawyers and also te te techie people um, are de depicting the law as always lagging behind. The law never um, reaches the level of, uh, of technological innovation and creativity. But of course, again, here too, we see the flip side in Professor Jasanoff's own description, uh, because sometimes, actually, the law runs ahead. In what sense does it run ahead? It runs ahead since it is actually more advanced. And it promises, or at least it has the promise, that is never fulfilled. So the promise of the human rights, the promise of social justice, these promises, these high um, um, and enduring values um, that humanity somehow, um, and again in the paper, um, it is even more, um, I would say, um, kind of clear um, with, with Kant's um, um, lamenting the crookedness um, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, human, of humankind um, as a crooked tree that cannot be straightened. It cannot be strengthened, not just in a general, but as compared to the yardstick um, of morality, and of course, as compared to the yardstick of human rights law. So again, here too, what we see is this double uh, move in which on one hand, the law lags behind, but on the other hand, it promises something. And I think that all these kind of um, oscillations that I was describing 
are where Professor Jesenov opens up the space for critique that she finds. Because it is not just the, um, the pessimistic um, or the deconstructive um, or the critique um, without the constructive, but actually these are all elements um, that Professor Jesenov um, um, would like us to, um, to recover and to revive um, as citizens. How am I doing time-wise, Shai? Five minutes, two minutes, yeah? Okay. Um, so perhaps lastly, what I would like to, um, to do is to talk about um, two things that are kind of tied. Um, one is the element of risk that was also um, um, mentioned um, in the talk. And the second is going back and, and perhaps finishing um, with a question of, of unreason um, um, in, in politics and perhaps also in science. Um, so just a, just a couple of words uh, about risk. Um, and of course, it is, it is highly important for STS scholars in general uh, because risk assessment um, is, a, is a major pillar um, of many of the scientific or scientific in quotation marks or in scare quotes um, um, that are moving a lot of the discussion and that are, again, as, as Professor Jasenoff um, says, kind of uh, um, these are the um, kind of the, it's a heaven for STS scholars because it, uh, it, descri it kind of um, reveals so many um, elements of the constructedness um, of, um, um, of science and of so much of what gets in and what gets out, whose risks are being taken care of, whose risks are being denied, um, where do we um, look for a risk, how do we assess them, how do we know them, etc. And an interesting thing here, again, um, and if you recall, again, going back to uh, globalization, is that for Ulrich Beck, um, the, the German sociologist, risk was perhaps one of the moments in which humanity discovers its own um, cosmopolitan nature. Um, why is it such? Because through um, um, climate change, through um, the risk of, um, of an atomic disaster such as uh, uh, Fukushima, etc., we discover, actually, that we are all tied to each other. We discover, so to speak, um, um, the, the true nature um, of our global um, cosmopolitan um, existence. Um, and in this sense, um, I think that, that what we see today, again, um, um, in, in the new politics of Trump, of Brexit, and a lot of the kind of uh, what Annalise Riles has, has called the inward-looking societies, um, which are not deglobalizing yet, but are beginning to slowly look within themselves and, and, um, and revert their gaze back into themselves. Um, and I think that what we, again, kind of um, understand is that the relative safety um, or, or the uh, kind of um, banishment of risk from our lives has been at the expense of many, many people um, that were simply not taken um, into account. Um, and this, again, risk um, is both um, between the North and the South or between the West and the East, but a lot of it has been done within our own societies. So, um, of course, we are used to, um, and I would kind of generalize to all of us, um, to have food security. Um, we can't even think that some kind of, uh, um, um, of a commodity will run out. But in the majority of places in the world, actually, hunger, um, 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 dry, um, um, dry periods, um, floodings, um, and things that actually, of course, um, risk not only the subsistence, but also um, the, food uh, the food flow, et cetera, um, are in existence, not, and again, uh, and also um, in our um, uh, backyard. Um, so I think that um, thinking about how to re-divide uh, um, risks, how to reallocate risks, is another um, lesson that goes both to the profound levels of, the, of STS, that is, how do we even assess risks, but also, again, at the political level of how do we redistribute risks. And um, one last thing about that, and also relearn um, in our own self to live with risk. And I think that as long as we think that we can just redistribute risk um, and that, in a sense, everybody will be safe, we're actually ignoring something very profound about human existence um, and about being actually in the world is that there will always be risk. And the desire to actually eliminate risk will always mean that someone will bear the risk and we won't. Now, one last perhaps thought about, um, again, kind of unreason um, in politics. Um, and here again, I go back to Weber. Um, 
which I think um, kind of whose spirit um, definitely hovers um, above a lot of, uh, um, of, of the talk that Professor Jasanoff um, um, gave in the cage um, of reason and in the kind of bureaucratic um, regimes that are tying us and depriving us from, um, from our own will. So for Weber, um, the emergence um, of the other of the disenchantment, that is, of the enchanted or the re-enchanted, was always an eminent both risk but also um, effect. Um, so perhaps it is not a, not a surprise um, that we see in all domains um, the unreason um, and the, uh, the attack of re on reason um, re-emerging. Um, and I think that, again, as a, as a real challenge to our liberal politics, um, we need to think about how can liberalism reincorporate, um, I started with risk, but also the unreason, the, the irrational, not by just delegating it to either psychology or to other domains um, or to faith and to religion, but actually how to reintegrate these um, profound traits of ourselves that are unreasoned, that are illogical, that are irrational, um, and to see how we can actually live with them and not delegate them elsewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Shai Blanc. Professor Shai Blanc, would you like to uh, respond? And I think uh, we should make it the bill. Okay. Uh, we have a few, a few uh, minutes, um, and we'd love to hear your response. That one again. doesn't do it? No, no, that one won't. Okay. All right, so, um, Yasha, thanks, thanks enormously for that thought, thoughtful reading and point, picking up points in a paper that are somewhat submerged. Um, and um, thank you for bringing them to the surface and, and um, giving us much additional food for thought as well. Um, so, the doubling point, I mean, that along all of those dimensions that you mentioned, uh, too, much, uh, uh, too much or too little reason, too much or too little globalization, um, um, you didn't say too much or too little democracy, although you might have to some extent. Um, I mean, yes, I completely agree that, th that you could look at the paper as raising those sorts of issues. But I think below all of that runs the undercurrent of whose reason is it anyway, because where you stand with respect to the too much or too little depends rather on what originating framework you're, you're talking about in the first place, right? I mean, so on the um, risk society point, for instance, if you accept a certain set of risks as already given in advance and a prioritization, uh, then you will uh, treat as irrational uh, somebody else's prioritization of the same thing. And you could see a Weberian dynamic at work here in that the very early proponents of this thing that has subsequently become the, quote, science of risk assessment, unquote, that they spent equal amounts of labor, intellectual labor, on creating a stratification of risks. I mean, that is, which risks were worth worrying about and which risks were not worth worrying about. And in the social sciences of risk analysis, that movement has played out in Nobel Prize winning um, social science, uh, Kahneman and Tversky being the, the two proponents of that kind of thought that are best known, but there was a host of other people, like consultants to the energy industry, for instance, in that period. I don't know if the name Chauncey Starr means anything to you at all, for instance, or not, or Paul Slovic. Um, I mean, so, or Baruch Fischoff, 
probably does may mean something to you. But in any case, there was an enormous amount of work done to show that uh, fear of nuclear power, for instance, was irrational, and non-fear of bike accidents was equally irrational. Um, and then you have to lay beside that, you know, what other kind of work are these relative classifications of the nature of risk doing in the world? I mean, so do we have a democratic governance regime for nuclear power as a result of, you know, since 1949 or thereabouts, all of the investments that have been made? And I think a reasonable answer to it would be, no, we don't. I mean, so people were not prepared for Fukushima. To this day, they don't know what to do with the results of Fukushima. They can say various things like, you know, why is Germany being so irrational, phasing out its nuclear power when it is actually paying much more for electricity as a result? And moreover, Germany doesn't have tsunamis or earthquakes, so why should they care, right? But, you know, that doesn't address at all Germany's own logic for doing what it's doing, which include views that maybe it's the rest of the world that is not paying adequately for a fossil-free energy future, and that the transition should not be looked at with my Kennedy School colleagues' eyes of rationality, which say Germany is paying overpriced things for um, its transition away from nuclear power, but rather that if we were all to pay fair prices, maybe we would end up paying something different. Um, in the cases that I talked about also, the framing problem, I think, comes out most clearly in the, in the debate between, on the one hand, Scalia's view of governance of, of what global warming ought to look like, and on the other, the preceding, much earlier, uh, debate that I described in India that is about the same thing, in a way. I mean, it's whether, and this is the connecting thread among the three co cases, which I didn't articulate sufficiently clearly, they all are about making markets. I mean, that is the rationality of economics and the fact that these are all about markets runs through all of these cases. Um, you know, World Trade Organization creating a single market, the, the greenhouse gas case creating a single market for, for carbon emissions and so forth. Um, but the, the idea that Ontology in the market is always a joint product of ideas of justice, i.e. normativity, and also ideas of beingness, you know, scientific and technological ideas. Uh, that, I think, is a missing in ingredient. And stepping back, you know, one might... I mean, how would a historian look at the climate change debates of the from 1980 to, say, 2020? Um, you might argue that what COP21 was forced to do, in effect, by recognizing that each nation had to articulate its own standards for the reductions it would achieve, and not a cap-and-trade system for the world as a whole. You could see that as a tacit recognition, belatedly, after the fact, with a lot of creaking and grinding, that from the start, the presumption that there was a single carbon in the world that needed to be regulated in a single form of rationality was not the right one. So this isn't about too much or too little rationality. It's about which rationality counts as the governing rationality in the case. And this is where I think the law, as you absolutely correctly point out, I think can serve as a proactive or a site of proactive reform in a way, because it remains one of our more powerful instruments for saying that the way in which people thought about this issue was not the right way, that we should not have been thinking about property as if it belonged only to white males. I mean, you know, there was unreason to that. It isn't about too much or too little reason. It's about whether that reason, the governing reason, is the reason we should adopt. And what I'm saying about markets is that they are eminently a place of reason, a place of reason that depends on these sameness, difference, judgments, and demarcations, and those are always political. And again, I totally agree with you uh, that my brand of STS, the kind of STS that I think law and legal scholars ought to pick up on, is not the nihilistic deconstruction. It's not just, you know, 
a thumbing of the nose, look, I understand how you put all this together. I think that what the law allows us often, first of all, is a moment of reflexivity. This is a different kind of inward looking, if you will, and inward looking that I think is needful in our professional classes. And that is a different form of inward look looking from the kind of isolationist nationalisms that we have in progress right now. We, we as professionals, through our networks and through our claims of universalism, have created a set of facts in the world. And to some extent, the turning away, the, the unproductive inward lookings that we see in the populisms of Western democracies are a response, I think, to the fact that we as professionals and globalists in that sense may not have been paying sufficient critical attention to where our own universalisms are coming from. I think that the law allows for that. It allows a kind of critique. I think you know, we have decades of critical legal scholarship to show that any given legal system, whether it's a body or kind of law like international law or whether it's a country's law like American tort law, that all of these embody their own blinders and that people from inside can't necessarily see those blinders in the way that people from outside can, that this is one of the great benefits of interdisciplinarity. It's not, it's not that problems are complex and you need inputs from 16 different streams in order to solve that problem. It is, what did you do in the first place to make that problem look the way it does? It just may not be the right problem. If you're trying to solve a problem of global justice and energy distribution, maybe the single market and carbon is a completely useless tool for arriving at that. Maybe you should be starting off in some other place I'd like, uh, by way of conclusion, to extend uh, to you all uh, an invitation to hear uh, Professor Sheila Jazanov this Friday at 10 o'clock at the Vilnius Jerusalem Institute, and also to invite uh, the fellows and invitees and, and faculty uh, downstairs to the student lounge for uh, reception. Uh, thank you again.